So today I wanted to talk about the Psychiatric Genomics Consortium um, preprint on schizophrenia risk disorder. Is there a, uh, this is their preprint for what they call PGCC, PGC3, uh, the third uh, like set of papers um, uh, from this consortium. So they posted a med archive preprint um, not so long ago. Um, like actually last month in September. Um, and it's actually quite popular. We can see that like several thousands of people have looked at it already. Um, um, and that's because like this is the like this is a big study and involves like a, a ton of people. Um, and um, like they've uh, processed data from thousands of individuals um, to get to this point. And so their main finding here is that they have a GWAS plot where um, they found 270 schizophrenia um, risk loci. Um, uh, and like these are, they're all the green um, uh, symbols here. Uh, what is it, green like um, diamonds. Um, um, and so the y-axis here showing the minus log 10 p value uh, for the GWAS um, uh, results, so like the, the, the risk that that particular range um, uh, conveys to having schizophrenia. Um, and the line here, I think, is like uh, 5 to the 10 to the minus 8. That this red line, so any of the points above it become um, a risk loci. And several of them are like in high uh, linkage disequilibrium. So that means that they get transmitted, they get um, um, transferred across generations um, fairly frequently. And so those, that's why like you might see like other SNPs that are also above the line, but they're, um, but because they're like in high LD with one of what they call the index SNPs, then it's considered to be part of the same uh, uh, risk profile, let's say. Um, and so there's a ton of them. Uh, PGC2 had like um, 100 and so uh, risk low size, so it's kind of like around doubling of that size uh, compared to the previous paper. Um, one of the things they did here was uh, uh, they assessed uh, the polygenic risk score. Um, and how that can, uh, that polygenic risk uh, prediction, um, um, how good it is at um, predicting who's, who's gonna get schizophrenia. Um, and so one of the things uh, is this plot here, uh, panel A, where they look at different p-value thresholds. Um, and then they have this liability r square on the y-axis. Um, it's it kind of improves a little bit as you like consider um, uh, a less stringent p-value threshold for making that polygenic risk score. Um, and so they have 90 cohorts. So they do this um, on um, validation of 89 left out cohorts for predicting that score. Um, um, so I'm not super familiar with polygenic risk scores, but I would say like Kind of looks okay to me. Uh, one of the things they had they wanted to assess was uh, uh, whether it was best to compute this polygenic risk score by ancestry uh, separately or all together. And in this particular case, 80% of their individuals that they use uh, for the analysis are of European descent and 20% or so are from Asian ancestry. And so this panel B over here shows on the y-axis shows the combined ancestry um, versus the within ancestry but this is using um, um, uh, uh, yeah I forget who, which one they use here within ancestry um, let's look at liability oh so that's the um, Asian, I think, within ancestry. So the um, interpretation of this plot is like basically nearly all the points 
are above the diagonal. So they have a better liability R square here when, um, when we, they come from this combined ancestry instead of the within ancestry. Um, and so this is their way of saying like, okay, like it's, it's not too bad that we have all the data from, um, or 80% of the data from one ancestry group, the European ancestry group, because it looks like both of them perform better um, when we, they use the data from everything. Um, um, although like, I wouldn't say this is a very comprehensive analysis either because like they're only assessing two ancestries, right? The Asian ancestry and the European ancestry, and there might be other ones there to consider. Um, um, but that's like, I mean, it's hard to do anything right now, right? Because they've been collecting this data for years. Um, and, uh, and I think my understanding is that they collect a lot of data from the UK too. Um, so there might already be some biases to specific ancestors because of the, of the locations where they're collecting data from. Um, they have a couple extended data plots, but one of them I want to show us here is extended data plot four, figure four. And here uh, they use GTEx, which is a genotype tissue expression project. Uh, they use version eight of the data from that project. And GTEx is a study um, that is looking at um, healthy or presumably healthy individuals. Um, uh, across multiple brain regions. And the idea of that project was to identify patterns of expression across the different tissues of the human body. And so in GTEx is a quite popular data set because uh, uh, of how well it was done. And in particular here, um, it's useful for them to assess where the genes that they find are mostly from uh, brain or not brain. And so GTEx version 8 has a couple of brain regions. So they have frontal cortex, um, and anterior cingulate cortex, etc. They have like 11 or so brain regions. Um, and so that is the y-axis, the different tissues from GTEx. Um, they, uh, on the methods, they describe how they normalize the polycarnacic data. Um, to then determine which genes were expressed in, in some of these uh, tissues or brain regions. Um, and so uh, what we see on the x-axis is a p-value, a minus log 10 p-value of the enrichment. And so here they have the three phases of the uh, psychiatric genomics consortium uh, for schizophrenia. Um, and so we see that uh, they use two methods for doing this enrichment, MAGMA and LDSC, and they see, we see a lot of orange, which means that both methods uh, found um, these tissues to be enriched. Um, um, and so the message from this is that uh, several of the genes that show, or like in these risk regions for schizophrenia from the GWAS study, are actually enriched in, um, um, genes are expressed in the brain mostly. So we only see like brain categories showing up. Uh, so we don't, show, we, we don't see like blood or other brain or other tissues like that. Um, but then the message is also like, basically nearly all the brain regions show up as enriched. So um, the risk might not be as confined to a, a single brain region. Right? so it's like a bit more generalized across the whole brain. Um, 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 so that's, that's a message from this plot at the bulk level. And the next plot they have is at like a single cell level. And so they use a couple of reference data sets that um, uh, have generated uh, single cell data or things like that, uh, that identify like, like cell types um, in the brain either in the human brain or the mouse brain. And so uh, across these two, like let's say sets, uh, these reference sets for cell types, the ones that show up and rich are mostly this pyramidal neurons. Um, 
um, one said that they call them SS1, and another said they call them pyramidal CA1. Um, so they might be actually like slightly different regions, uh, sorry, neurons. Um, but like it's mostly neur neuron types that are um, associated with schizophrenia risk. Uh, the ones that are not associated with schizophrenia risk are like the glia, for example. Um, so like microglia um, or endothelial cells um, are not associated with schizophrenia risk. Um, uh, so genes that are highly expressed in microglia or predominantly expressed in microglia right, are not the ones associated with schizophrenia risk. Um, which um, you can kind of see that was kind of you know, basically like known from the previous phases, or basically from PGC2. Um, so this is congruent with PGC2, uh, uh, these results here. Um, and so now that we have a bunch of uh, regions of the genome that are associated with schizophrenia at risk, they want to try to prioritize the genes. Um, um, uh, for downstream studies. And so they use this strategy called fine map, which I would need to read more about what that fine map exactly is doing. Um, and they have this, um, like, they have this diagram for us. Uh, we have, like, let's say three major slices of pie. The blue slice of pie is genes within the regions of schizophrenia risk. And some of these regions are broad. Um, um, and so they, we see that like out of like around like 1400, 1500 or so uh, genes within regions, like 290 of them are broad, 114 are priority ones. Um, and so from both the broad and priority, they like try to fly map them. And so there's this K argument over here, um, which I, um, I don't fully understand right now. Um, but then from the priority ones, sorry, yeah, from the priority ones, some of them, they call them like high C, which I thought was like, um, uh, there's a, uh, technique called high C for modeling the chromatin. Uh, but this high C acronym actually stands for something uh, completely different, which is, um, high quality. Um, uh, I think it's high quality, but I don't know. So, um, uh, High Cs, they call it protein coding genes with SMR evidence. And so SMR stands for, um, um, I think S this is for single, and then MR is for Mendelian randomization or simple Mendelian randomization. So that's another program um, um, that I guess is uh, pretty, um, uh, that is actually used quite a lot uh, for these fine mapping uh, projects. Um, so they have a couple of them here, and then like some SMRs. Um, um, so um, I don't know. This I would need to understand a couple of things more to fully uh, understand this figure here. Um, uh, but it's just like um, like a different way of a bar plot, really. Um, um, and the next thing they did is like um, uh, several people have uh, um, uh, have produced lists of gene sets that are linked to other disorders. So, for example, one of them is the autism spectrum disorder, or a couple of developmental disorders. And so they run a couple of gene sets analysis to see if those dis if those disorders are enriched in the schizophrenia uh, risk regions. Um, and so a lot of them are. Um, um, and so this is saying like, oh, like schizophrenia shares uh, uh, some potential pathways maybe or, um, um, or mechanisms with some of these other disorders. Um, um, and uh, actually, some of these ones I think are from rare variants. And so um, uh, some of these gene sets come from rare variant analysis on some of these other disorders. Um, and so this is like, oh, like, um, uh, 
maybe we find some information in the future, let's say related to let's say ASV, we might then find something that actually applies to schizophrenia too, right? Um, so that's what they're trying to show on this plot and what's the conclusion from this plot. This last one here, figure five, um, I found a bit confusing, but like the idea is that we're looking at some uh, something equivalent to gene ontology, um, but instead of the uh, the regular gene ontology that we use, they use another one called Singu, uh, which is like an expert created ontology. Um, um, and what this plot shows is that at the center we have the parent terms from an ontology, and as we go outside of the circle, we have um, child terms. Um, so the big circle in the middle is the synapse term, and then that gets broken up into pre-synapse and post-synapse. Those are two of the major child terms of the synapse term. Um, and then they, all of these terms get further broken up into smaller and smaller like child terms. And the color that we see here is the number of genes um, that um, uh, have that single um, category, um, um, Singeo category. Um, and the A side on the left, this is looking at all the fine map genes um, 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 and SMR associated genes. And then the B side uh, is looking at those 114 prioritized genes that they have. Um, and so like if we look at the shape and colors of the plot, they look fairly similar between the two. The one on the left has a bit of darker colors because uh, there's more genes. Because um, um, they're showing it as number of genes instead of like, let's say a percent. Um, um, and so the, the message here is that really both the prioritized genes and the like fine map genes, which are like, um, um, like a little bit less of a stricter uh, threshold. Um, uh, both set of genes here um, are rich for the pre-synapse and post-synapse uh, terms. Um, and then they show here on the B side, like some of those actual gene names. And so we've, we've seen a few of these also at Lieber um, or uh, already in other studies, um, publicly available studies. Um, I don't actually like, um, know the full list on top of my mind, but I've seen some of them. Um, and so this, you know, this was a, a bit of a complicated plot, but then the idea is like, okay, um, the, uh, this uh, CNGO result is not really affected whether, by, whether we look at only the prioritized genes or a bit of a less a strict threshold of genes. Um, um, and so um, I wanted to show the conclusions, the discussion, sorry, um, a little bit uh, what I have highlighted myself. Um, and so they mentioned here a couple of genes and they say that there's a convergence of rare and common variant associations um, that um, is interesting because a lot of the GWAS is mostly looking at common variants. And so um, they're bringing in here rare variants. Um, and so that might open a, um, like a new uh, set of type of studies, right? That look at, at, at rare variants instead of just common variants. Um, um, and so talking again about the rare variants, if I like it overlaps with some genes, um, related to rare coding variants in some of these other neuro neurodevelopmental disorders. Um, and so that could like, uh, uh, that is results from those other studies or disorders could lead to a further, further prioritization of the genes um, uh, from the GWA study. Um, then they see that, uh, uh, that basically like the genes that are and these risk regions are most expressed in, in the brain, in, in multiple brain regions. Um, and, uh, and so that's, they see that it's a, across multiple brain 
regions, not a single one, right? So this is a more of a common brain effect. Um, and even though they talk a lot about the synapse, right, the pre and post synapse and those seen geotherms, seen, seen geotherms um, they say that it might not be uh, just the synapse, it might go beyond that. Uh, and some, some of those neuronal compartments can be of importance. And I wasn't actually aware that they, there was this companion pair paper called schema or schema. Um, 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 and so, I mean, I haven't even read that paper. Um, and so that's, that's what they show here uh, on this, on this preprint. Um, and I'll say that I was a point that, that there was no like link to the code or anything like that. The methods are like um, specific enough that you can understand what they did. Uh, but it, like, um, I always like to see the code and they haven't made any of this public. Maybe they will in the future. Um, yeah, so this is a pretty big um, study and it's pretty, uh, we'll probably be using this list of risk um, loss like quite a bit ourselves uh, for our own studies. So with that, let me uh, stop the recording.